I want to win self-driving cars. Yeah, we're running it on a phone. I could build a better vision system and test the autopilot myself in three months. Google is going to lose because there's no market for a $100,000 system. For us, we're just going to push the software up there. And then boom, all these cars are level four self-driving. We got the insurance company to underwrite the policy. You don't have to pay attention anymore. Done. This is the world's first unlocked iPhone. At 17, George Hotz became one of the world's most famous hackers when he was the first person to break into the iPhone and reconfigure it to be compatible with non-AT&T providers. He was also the first to jailbreak the PlayStation 3, allowing people to play non-Sony games and use unapproved software. But whereas Apple co-founder Steve Wozniak sent him a letter of congratulations, Sony sued him. I'm getting sued by Sony! Hotz, known online as GeoHot, quickly became a cause celeb of so-called hacktivist groups including Anonymous and LulzSec. They attacked Sony's network despite Hotz's protests, igniting a firestorm of legal and media scrutiny. This case is about a lot more than what I did and me. It's about whether whether you really own that device that you purchased. Now this 28-year-old technical wunderkind is up against Waymo, Tesla, Uber, and most of the auto industry in the race to build the first fully operational self-driving vehicle. He's taking an approach drastically different than his well-financed competition. I don't belong in Silicon Valley. I don't. His company, Kama AI, is trying to bring plug-and-play driverless technology to the masses, and is doing so with $3.1 million in seed money. Kama's dozen-member team, which works out of a house in San Francisco, has built technology that takes over the existing radar and drive-by-wire systems in modern cars, incorporates a smartphone's camera and processor, and then makes the car drive itself. We're the Android of self-driving cars, right? Think about Tesla as the iOS. All these other manufacturers are hopelessly clueless when it comes to self-driving. How do we build something that just works on their cars, right? And so the idea is that you would then be able to plug and play your self-driving system in pretty much any production car. You need some tailoring to the car, but so what we're trying to do is you take the top 20 cars in America, and that's like 50% of the cars sold, we want to support most of those. How does your system work? in contrast to other systems that use sort of a lot of expensive sensors like LiDAR, you have to have a lot of equipment, you're just tapping into the car's existing capabilities, right? We ship a camera and we use the radar that's built into the car and we use the sensors that are already in the car. Yeah, those systems are just not shippable. They're not feasible for passenger cars yeah. because there's no market for an $100,000. It's just a money sink, right? So, you know, this is just done by people who do not think about the feasibility of anything. So that's why we use cheap sensors. Gotcha. Thousand dollars, not hundred thousand. And you think that that's sufficient to be able to accomplish everything that the other self-driving companies are, are doing with their LiDAR systems? Oh, absolutely, right? So the truth is even with those LiDAR systems, nobody is at, is at level four. There are six levels of self-driving ability. Today's offerings such as Tesla's Autopilot and Kama AI's OpenPilot max out at a level two, which means the car can auto-drive, but the driver constantly needs to pay attention and be ready to take over. The Holy Grail is level four, at which point the car can handle all driving on most roads, the steering wheel and pedals can be removed, and the human becomes a passenger who can read, nap, or take in the landscape. In order for you know, that to be okay, your system better be a good bit better than humans. Not perfect, it's never ever gonna be perfect, but you know, it's gotta be better than humans, right? And no system is there yet. So before you started Kama AI, which is your current uh, company, you gave an infamous interview to a Bloomberg reporter where you took the reporter on a ride in this self-driving sure. car that you had worked on for a month and you just got to work that morning. Go ahead. Here goes nothing, man. Press it. Good? Yeah, good. Yeah, let go. Jesus. <laughs> Are you crazy or how did you, how did you know that you weren't gonna die when you brought that out onto the road? It's the same safety model that we have today. The safety works like this, it's twofold. One, the second you touch either the gas or the brakes, the system just stops doing anything, right? So you always have that, that user override. But the other one that you even need more than this, you need to make sure that the car is never gonna do anything so quickly that you can't respond. And the way you deal this, with this is torque limits. You know, like it's never gonna go like that. It can't, it can't. There's hard limits preventing that. And actually, I didn't even write them. I'm using the hard limits that were built into the car. Gotcha. So, so the car has its sort of own built-in system where the power steering, which is mostly electric now and not hydraulic, will not be yeah. able to jerk it in front of a truck or something like exactly. that. Exactly. 
Kama's first consumer product is an app called Schiffer, which turns your phone into a dash cam and uses its GPS and accelerometer. Now the company is launching Panda, an open source $88 dongle that plugs into your car, links it to your phone, and puts out fine-grained detail about every aspect of your drive. So you can actually use a Panda as the bridge between OpenPilot, which is the software that'll drive your car, and the car itself. Panda is a universal car interface. So when it's used by Schiffer, it's read-only, but when it's used by OpenPilot, uh, it's connected over USB, and it can actually drive your car. Okay, so that's what taps you into the, the car system, so you can move the steering wheel. Exactly. What kind of cars, like, can I use this on my 89 Volvo, or, like, do I need for a newer car? Schiffer, for Schiffer, you'll get something from every car manufactured after 1996. Now, if you want to get the fancy self-driving stuff, well, um, there's only a few cars that OpenPilot supports. Right now, we're going to start getting a lot more. Like I said, I want, you know, in 2018, I want to support the majority of the top 20 cars sold in America. And right now, is there like a baseline of cars that have, you know, uh, drive-by-wire, brake-by-wire, gas-by-wire that you can mm -hmm. tap into? Yeah, so we support, it's, it's, it's Hondas and Acuras right now. Um, we just bought a Toyota Prius. We're going to be doing all the Toyotas this year. Uh, a user, one of our users, has ported it to the Chevy Volt. We have a bounty program. Um, as soon as he cleans up the code a little bit we're, and merges it in, we're going to pay him out $10,000. We have a bounty up for the Ford Fusion for somebody to do that. We have a bounty for the Tesla Model S, BMW i3, uh, and we want to support them all. Gotcha. So you're kind of hacking into the car maker's systems, essentially, in order well, to I wouldn't think about it like that. You're certainly not hacking into anybody's systems. It's your car, right? You're, right. Not, you're not hacking. You're not, like, changing the firmware. You're not jailbreaking. You're right. just, every car has a different API to get to the steering wheel, the gas, and the brakes. Um, so, you know, it's about finding the APIs in the new cars. But the car makers, they don't want you to be able to have access to They don't that, care. Right? Car manufacturers sell cars, right? What do they care? Yeah. <laughs> so why don't, why don't you just call up Chevy and be like, hey, can I get access to the Volt? Why do you pay $10,000 bounty? Let's even say they wanted us to get access to it, right? I think they're not opposed to it. I think they probably would rather us do it than not because at the end of the day, you sell more Chevys, right? But, you know, they got to go through their lawyers and you're talking to the business development guy and then he, oh, he's a level five. He can't be in the meeting with the level fours. And they're just such bureaucratic organizations that it'll take me less time to reverse engineer it than it will to get legal approval. And then once you finally do get legal approval, oh, you can be sure it's coming with a 10-page contract that says you can do this, 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 not this, and this, and not this, and definitely not that. Don't even think about that. We'll sue you. Liquidated damages. And I'm not playing with that. We're going to reverse engineer it. We're going to make it open. So you're asking for forgiveness, not permission, basically? I'm not even asking for forgiveness, right? <laughs> I'm just not, yeah. like, there's no permission to be asked. It's yeah. your car. I don't need permission to, you know, to use my things that I buy however I right. want, right? Yeah. So maybe I think a lot of people should get out of this mindset of thinking, right? And I've always said this with, like, the jailbreaks and stuff. Get out of the idea that, like, you know, you know you're buying the PlayStation 3 and it's a closed box and actually Sony owns it and you don't. No, 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 no. Stop thinking like that, right? So you've described Panda as basically like a Fitbit for your car. You get all this information, all this data coming from your car about yeah. the driving and the driver. But you're you're also feeding this information that you crowdsource because you, you have all these different people who are voluntarily mm -hmm. putting this software in their car. And you're feeding that into an AI, which then is learning how to drive. So how do you think that this approach is is different and why is it better than what Waymo is doing, what you know Tesla is doing, these sort of bigger players? Tesla understands more about what we're doing, but let's look at Waymo, right? So Waymo, when they want to figure out how to build a self-driving car, they sit four engineers down in a room and they talk about, okay, well, we come upon a stop sign. We know that we should stop and we know that we should stop this distance. And wait, could you get the, uh, the DMV handbook out? Let me see. Oh, okay, we have to signal 50 meter. That's not what driving is, right? This is the same failure of computer vision for many, many years, right? When people wanted to build like a detector to see if there was a chair in an image, they would write out the definition of a chair. They would say, okay, well, a chair has a back and it has four legs and it has, wait, what about a bar stool? Is that a chair? Well, I don't know. We're going to investigate bar stools. There's a lot of people thinking about this problem and it's absurd. You want to figure out how to, if there's a chair in an image or not, you get a million images with chairs, a million images without chairs, and you use machine learning to train a classifier that says chair or no chair, right? So that's the same approach we take to driving. There is no rigid specification or definition of driving. Driving is just what people do when they drive. And in order to really get access to the full diverse spectrum of what driving is, you need a huge crowdsource database. And I mean, that's what we're building. And then we'll just learn what it means to drive from people who actually drive. Hmm. 
right? Because you got to interoperate with humans, right? It's some, it's some like, it's some leftist utopian fantasy. Oh, we're going to wipe the roads of, of, of all the cars, and we're just going to have electric cars that interact. Look at a Google commercial if you want to see this, right? Um, it's not what's going to happen. Right? What's actually going to happen is there's going to be a bunch of self-driving cars, a bunch of human-operated cars, and they all got to interoperate, right? Right. And the humans ain't changing to match the self-driving spec. So you're saying that one advantage that you have is that you're not using Google engineers and Google cars and everything to go out there. You're actually looking at what real people yeah. are doing in the field. I don't think about what driving is. I say, so, show me what driving is, right? And that's the so that's more expensive then. If they want to add a new driver, you can add pretty much limitless people who yeah. have pandas. We have, we, have, we, have, we, have a, we have a huge network. We have, right. we have thousands of people on our network. And then the other advantage is that they're, they're taking like a rule-based approach. So like yeah. you're saying, they're defining a chair rather than letting the computer figure out what a chair is. Yeah. But don't they also use AI and sort of deep learning techniques? What, what's the difference in, well, in their systems? So, I mean, everybody is moving towards AI and deep learning, right? And like, obviously Google is going to, you know, get to level four before we will. Nobody doubts this, right? But the reason Google is going to lose is they're going to get to level four with a $100,000 system, right? And then they have a whole thing to go through to deal with, you know, okay, how do we actually get this in the hands of people? If we solve, if we get the AI problem solved a year after Google, Google's still going to be sitting there thinking, okay, well, you know, maybe we could uh, finance it to people. For us, we're just going to push the software update, right? I'm going to push the button and be like, and you know, Elon knows this too, right? We're just going to push the button and then boom, all these cars are level four self-driving. We got the insurance company to underwrite the policy. You don't have to pay attention anymore. Done. Hmm. Right? And that's the common AI plan, right? Google can only, you know, iterate and build on top of what other companies have already done. Was Chrome the first web browser? No, but it was the best, right? Was, was Android the first non-iOS, uh, you know, operating system for smartphones? No, but it was way better than like Symbian and BlackBerry OS, right? But, but it's not, Google in some ways is not like an innovative company, right? And then when they try to innovate, you get things like Google Glass. The Google self-driving car project is like Google Glass. I say Google is the Xerox park of the self-driving car industry, right? <laughs> you, know, you see all these good ideas, you bring them out, you fan out to all the other companies, right? Push another button and the information is sent electronically to similar units around the corner or around the world. This is an experimental office system. It's in use now at the Xerox Research Center in Palo Alto, California. Soon, Xerox systems like this will help you manage your most precious resource, information. They just grabbed, uh, grabbed defeat from the greatest victory in the computer industry. Xerox could have owned the entire computer industry today. So in this analogy, you would be sort of like the Steve Jobs going into the Xerox campus, getting the graphical user interface and everything like that, seeing that they're messing it up. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'm a lot more like the Bill Gates, maybe uh, Elon's the Steve Jobs. Um, <laughs> you want to be the Bill Gates? Yeah, I'll be the Bill wow, Gates. Wow, nobody right? ever wants to be the Bill Gates. That's great. Oh, no, 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 Jobs is, you know, he's, he's, yeah. I'm not uh, an Apple kind of company. I'm a lot more yeah. like a Microsoft kind of company. What do you mean by that? They practically are more art than technology, right? Now they do have good technology backing it up, but for me, the end result is technology. Technology is the only thing in history that has had this compounding effect on, on human wealth. Right? Everything, look, we live in houses, they're, they're, they're heated, they have lights, this is all, it's all technology, right? And that's what I wanna be a part of a lot more than, well, art. <laughs> and so you don't care about making things beautiful. Like, no, in the and same I, sense, though. yeah, I don't care about making things beautiful. I don't care about. I'm I'm very uh, anti-advertising, right? Like the idea of advertising, like we're almost going to like you know manipulate people into buying our, our, our product. And then you have like atrocious companies like Facebook. You know, Facebook. You're not a user of Facebook. You're Facebook's product. Facebook sells your attention to advertisers, right? Facebook uses you. Facebook uses you, right? Like, like that's, that's how it works, you know? It's not even in Soviet Russia. It's in, uh, it's in uh, Palo Alto, California, Menlo Park, right? Yeah, no, I never want to be that kind of company, right? Like, we build technology and, uh, you know, we open source as much as we can as well, mm -hmm. right? Because, you know, it's not about, here's the pie, I want my slice to be bigger. It's about, we can build a really big pie, let's build it. Mm -hmm. So Apple just recently announced that they are sort of scrapping their yeah. hardware initiative and they're just going software. Does that worry you? No. Um, so again, when you think about Apple as a company, they're going to play a lot more in the Tesla arena. What about that other 70%, right? Hmm. Most smartphones in the world are Androids. Most self-driving cars in the world in five years will become AI. So you basically want everybody who's watching this to be able to uh, turn their car into a self-driving car in five years. Yeah, I really emphasize no regressions. We're gonna, we're gonna work to make this better and better and better and more and more consumer friendly, right? This is all you need to drive a car. Yeah, clap! 
Kama AI's first attempt at consumer hardware was the Kama One, a full self-driving kit for under $1,000. But Hatsa boarded the product launch after getting a letter from the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration detailing safety concerns and regulatory compliance issues. Hots drew outrage both from those who saw the event as a government overreach and those who thought the government had valid concerns and instead of addressing them, Hots was just picking up his ball and going home. When you look at what we actually did, right, not what the media said we did. So, you know, maybe we didn't release the actual $999 comma one on Kickstarter, but we released all the plans for you to build pretty much exactly what the comma one was. And we released them for free and you could mm. build them for way less than a thousand dollars and self-driving car, the car could certainly drive itself. So, you yeah. know. The thing about the comma one was it was never gonna be a mass market product. We were maybe gonna sell a thousand of those to car enthusiasts. Um, so, you know, let's even say we're making, making $400 profit a unit. That's $400,000, right? Profit to come AI. That's more than, the lawsuit would cost me more, right? So it just didn't make economical sense hmm. for us to continue with the comma one as planned. We had to think of a more clever way to avoid a lawsuit, but still basically achieve the same outcome. And that's why we open sourced it. You want to start a company in the self-driving space? Literally rip us off. Literally, please. It's MIT licensed. Just download our stuff. Build it into your cars. Don't give me anything. You know, you look at the world like that, you realize open source is the way to go. Mm. Yeah, so what are the benefits to you of open sourcing all of your, your plans and your products? We can eventually work up to a consumer product and we can kind of let the market figure out, like if we don't build the best localizer, if somebody else builds an open source localizer, we'll use that. Coming as an ecosystem, we're going to be the constellation of you know, things surrounding Android, just as Android's an ecosystem, right? It's Google, it's the app developers, it's the phone manufacturers. With a Google for the ecosystem, but I want to see the Samsungs and the HTCs and the, right? Kama's new self-driving kit for under a grand is called the Kama Neo. Hot says it's similar to a Gear virtual reality headset in that it's powered by a smartphone. The Kama Neo mounts, cools, and connects the phone to the car. Kama's open pilot software then taps into the phone's camera and the car's systems to auto-drive it. And there are people out there who have these and they're actually posting on YouTube. 90, there's 99 people right now um, running open pilot. We have thousands on the Schiffer network. We'll see 10x growth in the next year. We'll have a thousand, right? We're, we're constantly growing. Right now, I'm not sure how many cars Waymo has running. So they might be the second largest network, but I think we're pretty close. And then Tesla obviously has tens right. of thousands of these things, right? And so the Common Neo is a sort of a full self-driving yeah. system. Maybe someday, I probably shouldn't say this, but like maybe someday all you're gonna need is Schiffer and Panda, right? You run the Schiffer app on the phone, it talks to your car with Panda, and maybe just your phone starts to drive your car. Right. Maybe. But right now you need a special phone. Well, right now you need the special phone running the special operating system. You know, you need a cooling solution because phones aren't quite at that point yet, but every year they get better. And every year, billions of dollars is poured into making smartphones better. Yeah. And we get to leverage that billions of dollars of investment of companies in a way that like, you know, no other self-driving company would even think, oh, they're running it on a phone? Yeah. Yeah, we're running it on a phone. Phones are really, really good. Yeah. It's super exciting when you think about like, really what's possible here. Right. And the fact that almost nothing can stop it. And that's why it's open source. Right? It's not even like, like, you don't have to like work with us. You don't have to sign some sketchy backroom business development deal. It is open source and MIT licensed. Please download it and use it, right? Like it's not like, you know, we're not one company. What, Nish, are you gonna, you're gonna issue a, you can't issue a recall, right? Like, who, what do you recall? We didn't sell you anything. You're gonna recall software? <laughs> yeah, good luck, um, right? So you mentioned Elon Musk. Release the Titan. So we've been able to accelerate autopilot and bring it to market faster. Every car coming off the line in Tesla at the factory has the autopilot hardware. You guys got into a little bit of a public spat, I guess, maybe it wasn't that negative, but in, in 2015, you kind of criticized some of his technology. I and... criticized his technology. I criticized his choice of a partner in Mobileye. Okay, yes, you criticized Mobileye. And Mobileye. I criticized the fact that he reneged on a contract. Yeah, not cool. <laughs> well, no. this is what I want to ask you about yeah. because you guys have kind of different stories about this. So... <laughs> My story's correct. <laughs> so he says you wanted to bet that you could outperform his system. Yeah. Right? And then you made this bet, and then you ultimately didn't want to agree to the bet. Um, Elon Musk needed a vision system for his car. He wanted to replace Mobileye. Uh, and I'm like, yeah, sure, I'll do it. Uh, give, me a, uh, give me a contract, and I'll, I'll get you something incredible, you know? Elon changed the deal at the last minute. He changed it from a contract, which has rigid completion criteria, to basically an option for him to buy. He's kind of like, build it, and then, you know, I'll pay you if I like it. Well, it's not worth it for me, right? At the time, he said in an interview that uh, you were underestimating the technical challenges involved, right? And he said, 
Quote, it's not like George Hotz, a one guy in three months problem. You know, it's more like thousands of people for two years. Well, it's, it's two years later, right? right? Who's closer? Who's, who's going to make this happen? I mean, Tesla's always going to be a little bit ahead of us. Yeah. Because um, they started earlier, right? All I said was I could build a better vision system than Mobileye myself in three months. And like, you know, I kind of did that, right? So yeah, the whole self-driving problem, no, of course that's going to be a, I'm not going to say thousand person problem. Kamei is a 12 person company. It's been about two years and I think it's going to be at least another three in order to fully solve the problem. I've come to respect a lot more what he said there about, you know, start a company, you need validation, you need good engineering practices. He's right. I'm fine. Yeah, I mean, you know, at the end of the day, I, I, you know, the, the egomaniac, a big ego. I love, I love, I love being right, but not at the expense of being wrong, right? Maybe it yeah. was a legitimate misunderstanding. You know, you should never, you should never attribute to malice what you can attribute to a misunderstanding. And I, I have a ton of respect for Elon Musk. Hmm. Um, I mean, I, I really do. It's nothing. It's nothing like how I feel about Ford. <laughs> Ford is a. Elon is doing so much good for the world when it comes down to it. I really do regret if I inconvenienced him in any way. I mean, you know, you punch me, I'm going to punch back a little. Right. But like, you know, yeah. like to, at the end of the day, Tesla's not our competition. We would love to see Tesla succeed. I would personally just love to see Tesla and SpaceX succeed because that's the kind of world I want to live in. You know, it comes right. back to the pie argument, right? I'd rather Elon Musk have a much bigger share of the pie than me, as long as the pie tastes awesome, right? Ford, on the other hand, like those companies need to lose. Right. Because what good are you doing for the world? You're holding the world back to make money, right? This is, you know, you know a big, big fan of capitalism, but like, you got to avoid rent seeking, right? You got to avoid rent seeking and, and, and monopolistic behavior and where you're just making money because you have kind of, you know. So yeah, Elon is doing, doing absolutely great things for the world. And if, if his capital was better deployed somewhere else besides paying me, then I, I think he made the right choice. So you also bet him last year that your system <laughs> could successfully navigate the Golden Gate Bridge that before he could. That one was played up by the media a whole okay. lot. We can both drive. I, I'm the media, so I'd like to play it up some we more. We can so both drive yeah. across the Golden Gate Bridge okay. without an intervention. <laughs> let's just say. That. So you both win. We both win. Everyone wins. Big pie. You know who doesn't win? Ford. <laughs> <laughs> I have to say though, I also really like your pie analogies because I'm also from New Jersey, so I love talking about pizza. So. Right. I appreciate it. Good, good pizza, yeah. <laughs> Last thing about Elon Musk, yeah. uh, he's he's become sort of an alarmist about AI. He wants international bodies mm. to regulate mm. it. He thinks it's going to mm. destroy humanity mm. if we don't do this. Yeah. It is the biggest risk that we face as a civilization is artificial intelligence. Once there is awareness, people will be extremely afraid. What do you think of that? I'm not sure it presents any particular threat that previous weapons have not. It's just about how the people are going to use the technology. Now, if Elon Musk is calling for an international arms control regulation, he should look at history and see how well that has worked. Um, <laughs> right? So you're skeptical of sort of intervening. You think it'll be it'll self-regulate, or people in the field are better. I think uh, that to I think respond. that yeah, you know, listen to people in the field. I certainly think that it's incredibly premature to talk about any sort of government level AI regulation. It's, just, it's not it's not going to kill me tomorrow. There's things that are a lot more likely to kill me tomorrow, right? Like yeah, driving. Right. Yeah. <laughs> All right. No, seriously, no. Yeah. Um, yeah, the, the AI alarmism. I mean, these aren't problems that we should be thinking about. But to believe that somehow in the next two years, Google is going to accidentally build Skynet is absurd. You're not an alarmist about AI in that sense. But you have, you know, raised a few eyebrows because you've said in the past that you think that AI is going to take everybody's jobs. Absolutely, yeah. And you cannot wait for that to happen. Absolutely, you think yeah. this is a good thing, of right? Of course. But people have been saying that since, you know, before the Industrial Revolution, right? The elevator operators were saying that, like, the elevator's going to take all the jobs. There's a great, so what's, what's yeah. different now? Um, so the Industrial Revolution replaced man's muscles, right? Very few jobs today, at least in first world countries, are people doing work with their muscles, right? You even think of, like, traditionally muscular work, like mining. It's not people with pickaxes. It's people with levers operating hydraulic machines, right? So, you know, people have always said, oh, it's going to replace all the jobs, right? The car really did replace all the jobs of the horses, right? There aren't that many horses left. The horse population of the world peaked in 1917. The last refuge is man's mind. And once you start building mines that are superhuman, um, well, 
you know, yeah, there are no more jobs for humans. It's, it's great. This is, this, is, this is a great world. Wait, wait, isn't this the, isn't this the end game of technology in general? Right? Didn't you sit there and be like, man, you know, I'm really sick of hoe in this field. Wouldn't there be great if there was some mechanized hoe, right? And then you got to sit on it and operate it. And now you, know, you go to a modern farm and it's got a, you know, it's a tractor with an Apple X GPS. I think like, you know, maybe some union is why the person still has to sit there, but they just don't do that much, right? They watch <laughs> the thing drive and the, and the, right? And I mean, this is a great world, right? This is this is a great world. Um, so, so Kama will ultimately be a mechanized hoe company, is what. <laughs> I mean, okay. yeah, we, we 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 work where our talents are. So, what does a world like that look like, where nobody has a job oh except God, for AI man. programmers? I think I think a month in advance. I think I think I got I got a, I got a date tomorrow night. I'm excited about that. That's about as far in the future as I think. But okay. I really, you know, you maybe want to date an AI at some point. <laughs> well, I think yeah. that would be really cool, right? Like you know, to replace. Uh, yeah, well, that that gets out. <laughs> people get are people outraged about people are outraged about everything today. But yeah, I want to date an AI, you just, of course. But you don't see this as a dystopian future. You're hopeful. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. No, I'm a complete optimist about the future. People are just outraged about things. I don't know why. We're living in the best time ever. Right? We are living in in in, in, in paradise practically. Yeah. When's the last time you had to deal with? Oh man, I want to go to the coffee shop, but there might be lions. <laughs> no, we beat lions, right? <laughs> so getting back a little bit to uh, the driving. So the, the data that you're collecting, uh, you know, it's about things like people's locations, their driving habits, you know, a lot of personally identifiable potentially information, things that would be attractive to stalkers, hackers, PIs, government agencies. Um, so, you know, being, being a super hacker yourself, you know that these things are vulnerable to outside groups coming in. So how are you protecting your customers' data and how do you view that, the privacy issues? So first off, let's talk about personally identifiable information from, from Schiffer, right? Um, we do not record either the microphone or the front-facing camera. I don't want pictures of your face. I don't want to know your name. I don't want to know your age. I don't want to know your gender, right? This is not your data that I'm interested in. This is your car's data that I'm interested in. I'm not trying to sell your data right. to advertisers, right? I mean, so I take your point, yeah. but I would say at the same time, that's the, the, the NSA makes a similar argument all, argument all the time, right? We're not listening to your phone calls. We're not looking at your Facebook profile. We just have metadata. Okay. But if you look at somebody's cool. metadata, you know, you can find out where they work, they have kids, where they go to school, where they go to church, what their religion is. I don't have a problem right? with the so NSA, like, just make the data public, right? I would have no problem with the NSA and metadata collection. I don't think these things are necessarily bad. I just don't like the idea that one organization has a monopoly on it, right? <laughs> Let's make the data more public. So you just don't value privacy as like sort of a, you know, in your own life. Like, would you be upset no. if privacy went away? Here's the thing about privacy in general, right? And it, at the end of the day, you know, people might yell at me for this, but this is really how you have to look at the world, right? The NSA is a big problem. And the reason the NSA is a big problem because they have privacy and you do not. Be nice if we both had privacy, but I don't see that happening either. So maybe the real solution is we don't have privacy, right? But they don't have privacy either. That's a pretty radical view, right? Like, uh, I don't right. think there's a lot of people who'd be very comfortable with all of their data being online. There's a difference between all of your data and all of your metadata, right? Right now, like, you know, data in terms of like, you know, what you're saying on a, on a phone call, maybe even if you make a phone call, but like where you drive, I mean, that's already public and we have to accept this. I could hire a PI to follow you around, right? And that doesn't really violate any expectation of privacy. I think when you step out of your home into the world, you know, you're entering a public space. And this is, this is what the laws say. Well, I mean, Google did it all with Street View, right? And if you're outraged about Street View, come on, right? <laughs> Google spends all this money to do this and then provides it as a free service for everybody. I love Street View, right? So you got to think about whether the, uh, you know, the benefits just outweigh the costs. I don't want to have a monopoly on data, right? This is the old way of thinking. What if we could open our data up more and really think about it not as like, you know, Facebook owns this data, Google owns this data, but we all collectively own the data, right? And you're contributing to a big collective pool of data. Right. Um, now it's, it's a market. It's yeah. not, you know, it's not like, oh, we're all going to do this for, right. for smiles and roses or, you know, whatever communists have. Create this data, contribute to this. All the data combined is a whole lot more powerful than any piece of the data alone. And I think we can do incredible things with these sort of data sets, right? What regulatory issues do you see having to tackle as you kind of move forward into a, a semi-self-driving or a full self-driving system? Well, I've even seen uh, this Nishta regime be a lot better than the last Nishta regime. The, the Mark, whatever his last name was, the head of the first Nishta, he talked about like how his dad died in a motorcycle accident and how this is a personal crusade for him and how if Tesla Autopilot has two more accidents, we're pulling it off the road. Stop. Stop. 30,000 people are dying a year. Stop with that rhetoric, right? 
let's use statistics, let's use math, let's use engineering, and let's solve these problems, right? You're not going to be able to constructively prove this is what you do with a stop sign. The arguments that should be made for these sort of things, and they're the kind of arguments that Tesla's making, are statistical arguments. Hmm. If it turns out that people with the system get into 50% less accidents than people without the system, the system is good. So is what you're saying that yeah. you're, you're arguing for outcome-based versus process-based exactly. regulation? Yeah. Are they actually adopting that sort of standard? Yeah, they do. They do. In fact, the Nishta Tesla autopilot letter, which came out after the comma one, was very encouraging for it. This is basically what Nishta said. Tesla said, here's our crash statistics before autopilot. Here's our crash statistics after. And, you know, at least like rear-ending collisions were reduced by 30%, as they should be, right? Yeah. Um, so this is, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great thing to see that Nishta accepted that argument. It'd almost be criminal if you were to ignore a technology that's saving tens of thousands of lives. Just to just anything that can can work outcome based should be what regulators look at. And do you identify as anything politically? No. You just are? Um highly tribal. No interest. It's all about the war with nature. You're sort of like an Adam Smith state Some, of nature kind of guy. Someday so I can eventually move into virtual reality and live in a great artificial world that everything is awesome, man, and they can go on cool quests every day and uh, slay dragon beasts and virtual dragon beasts. You know, no real dragon beasts have to die. Even vegans are okay with this, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's the thing. Stop fighting. Like At the bottom of your webpage, you have the text, uh, we are actually about to change the world. That mostly is a stab at other startups who use this rhetoric of we're going to change the world, right? Yeah, I mean, you know, Facebook's changing the world too. Yeah, you know, hey. Yeah. Hitler changed the world. Uh, you know, hey, it's, it's, not, it's not always right. Like, like we're, we're yeah. changing the, the world, we're not like using this to sell you egg timers. <laughs> whatever it is, whatever it is, whatever it is, we're not using so, it. So you're serious about it. You're we're actually about, changing we're the world. We're actually changing the world, All right? That's, that's mostly what it's about. Like, yeah, it's again, it's again, it's about like, like I think of the world as like nature and we're trying to build like, like, you know, more accurate localizers yeah. and then better sensors and put more data on the internet and grow yeah. the internet and like that kind of stuff, right? So that's what yeah. I mean by actually not, you know, I have a line in a song, I have a SoundCloud, soundcloud.com slash Tom Cruise. Um, uh, changing the world is just a euphemism for how can I get you to give more stuff to me. And I think that's how a lot of people view it. And here's my argument for this, right? I have the best phone. I have the best phone you can buy. In order to get a better phone, I would have to spend millions and millions and millions of dollars. I'd have to, what, I'd practically start a phone company, right? Because you can't buy a better phone than this, right? There isn't like a phone for $2,000 that's any better. So we have to move the world forward in order to get this technology that I want. I can't sit in my basement and build my own virtual reality thing. We need all the technologies that support that. We need to move the whole ecosystem further. You know, we need a better display technology. We need better localization technology for head tracking. Maybe we should start looking into like neurological link stuff so I can feel sensations, right? Like it's a huge, it's a, it's a bio, it's, it's, it's the biggest project maybe humanity's ever undertaken. Well, maybe AI is the biggest one and then AI can build me all those cool things. So. <laughs> and is this what open access is contributing to, that sort of uh, communal knowledge gathering? Who is, open, who is open access? Like even Tesla has gone to open access for their patents and some of their technology. You're open access. Oh yeah, I'm not intellectual property. Here's my view on intellectual property, right? It's kind of like we had this problem of like good scarcity, right? And a lot of wars are fought over good scarcity and like how many potatoes are there? I got to kill you because I need more potatoes. We build this intellectual property thing that's actually not scarce, right? Intellectual property is not a scarce good. And then we put artificial, we use guns to make it artificially scarce. Really, people? Really? <laughs> this is the best thing we could come up with, right? <laughs> um, so yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm all about like just, you know, we, yeah. shouldn't, we shouldn't really view it as like a monopoly on, 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 okay, I drew Mickey Mouse first, so Mickey Mouse is mine. You can't make Mickey Mouse porn. Definitely not, definitely not. I'm going to lobby to make sure you can, right? Come on. So you want the pie to be big enough that Mickey Mouse porn is a thing. Exactly. And it could be in a small sliver, maybe not a corner of the pie that I go to, but hey, you know, okay. to each their own, right? That is the first example you thought of, though. <laughs> well, <laughs> so you know, no, because that's the classic yeah. one. I mean, you think of, right. you think of the, the, the Sonny Bono Copyright Extension Act. You think about these Copyright Extension Acts that have yeah. been passed. Copyright is designed to incentivize the creation of work. Right. Why do you need to extend it to cover works that have already been created? For 70 years, for, for right? Plus the last it's, 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 the it's, it's, it's become absurd, right? And then like patents are this, this absurd, like, it's not, you know, they're just, just yeah. big companies fighting each other. Maybe it's monopolistic. Maybe it's not. It's not you're protecting your inventor anymore. Right. It's big companies who need a patent strategy. And, all right. Just to wrap up here. So your first goal is to get 
your software good enough where it's at a level three system, as, as you've said. So mm -hmm. where the driver can fully disengage and doesn't ex isn't expected to have their hands over the wheel the whole yeah. time, right? Uh, for certain stretches of road, at least. Like maybe if you're in traffic or if you're on the highway. Yeah. How far away are we from that? So our hardware isn't quite good enough to do that now. So we're going to need like the next generation of comma hardware which we're looking at. I mean, we're trying to be like the phone companies. We're trying to come out with something new every year, right? Our AI tech is gonna to need to be better. And then we're gonna to have to operate this thing in shadow mode for a while, right? Where people are using it, but they still have to pay attention. Then if it turns out that all these people paying attention actually didn't need to have paid attention by statistical arguments, then we'll show these statistical arguments to an insurance company or to a bank or, you know, insurance is a pretty simple game. Um, and then we say, okay, on these stretches of highway, your system is level three, feel free to disengage, you need to be ready to take over in 15 mm. seconds. Right? So your pitch to the insurance company is, hey, statistically our system is safer Absolutely. than if you let the driver Absolutely. drive themselves, yeah. so really you should want them Absolutely. to. And how long do you think it'll be before, if you had to give a, a guess, before that'll, that'll come online? Um, I think in some stretches of road, maybe two years. Um, and then you see like the full battle, you know, three, you start getting more, and then five, I think the self-driving car game is gonna kind of be over and you're gonna see who the winners are. All right, so in five years, I'll come back and see you and I won't have to drive myself? Is yeah, that, probably, uh... probably. All right, well, I'm, I'm, I'm counting on you to make this happen. Yeah, I, I'm really excited about it, but I'm just watching, so. I'm, I wanna make it happen. <laughs> hey, I, I, I might be wrong, you know, I'm, I'm always humble in the face of nature, um, so we'll see, we'll see, but I'm gonna try my best. George Hotz of Comma AI, thank you so much for talking to us today. Thanks for having me. For Reason, I'm Justin Monticello.